It's time for the panel and to moderate the panel today, I'd like to introduce my, uh, my, my colleague, Dave Lansbury, who after many years as CTO is now the Chief Digital Officer for the Open Group. Dave oversees the development, delivery and implementation of digital independently used standards. And this of course is key as digital standards can be best used together to accelerate the adoption of digital practices across an organization, facilitating sustainable and enduring value. You've seen our speakers so far, and uh, uh, we're running a little behind, so I'm just going to stop there and hand over to you. A warm welcome, please, for Dave Lansbury, Chief Digital Officer. Welcome, Dave. Great. Thank you, Steve. And if I could ask all the panelists to uh, turn their video on and unmute, we'll get started with the questions. Um, I will also note that um, some of our panelists have answered their questions in the Q&A. We'll, we'll skip those uh, answers, but please take a look there while we're doing these and we'll try to get to as many of the questions as we can. So I think our first question um, relates to the skills needed and you know how people move into these, some of these new roles that have been described. So do you think that product management methodologies like Agile and Scrum and maybe even PMP are evolving fast enough to uh, continue to be relevant alongside the uh, product management teams given today's uh, uh, volatile, uncertain, uh, and challenging environments. Yeah, I, I can go first, maybe. Um, having roles, I would say there's still a big separation between product management acumen and uh, what, what would be considered in regular IT, all these different roles that you have. Um, I've, I've had the, the benefit of working in both roles, you know, uh, a true product manager and a true IT person of some sort. Uh, but I still see a lot of disconnects when you go to, you know, these, these IT frameworks and practices, you, you don't see a lot of product thinking. And I, I think we have a ways to go on both sides to be frank. And, uh, but, but the good thing is. I think we're aware of it. We're here to, to help shape the future of, of how we bring these roles and acumen together and simplify things. To be honest, I think we can scale and, and do this better if we are simplified and, and product centricity is going to do that. Any other thoughts on these skills? Yeah, maybe I can respond to that, uh, Dave. So if I look at uh, frameworks in the market, they might not evolve that fast as we would expect it. For example, a lot of frameworks are not that uh, product centric. Uh, a lot of them are like uh, Scrum and, and DevOps, they look at the product, but then they don't look at the product at scale. So they say, uh, the, uh, and the same with the skilled agile framework, they have good <laughs> ingredients, but they don't look at the full portfolio of your services and products. So, so th I think that there's always some lagging behind because yeah, it's it's probably a combination of that people just take part of the best practices and implement and, and then figure it out what's best for them. And based on that feedback, maybe the, 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 the practices will change again. But I think the most important challenge I, I think still is that we got so many product owners or managers we need. And we probably has a difficulty to find the right person because a lot of times agile and DevOps teams, they believe they have the kind of a kind of a superman or a superwoman kind of a product manager, which in reality, that's not always easy to find those with all the skills combined. So hopefully it fits in the DevOps team as a whole. So the product manager is just one person in the team. So it's also important to understand the role of the whole team with all the combined skills. And maybe that's even more important than just the product manager role, right? having the right skills in that team or in the in the cluster yeah. yeah yeah definitely all of these new capabilities that are needed new competencies that we can really stretch our traditional set of skills that we've hired for for, for years so uh next question i think um, and this was targeted to charlie but i'll open it to everybody you know, can you comment on how to include the development of business and business architecture like new processes and new organization capabilities in the your presentation approach, you know, based on that was focused on DevOps and product teams. How do you how do you see that transition occur? Um, well, uh, since it was directed at me, I'll, I'll I'll take it. I mean, certainly, you know, former um, EA practitioner here, and I've 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 thought quite a bit about this. I think that Rob, um, what what I saw of Rob's presentation, there is definitely an analog. Uh, between business architecture and the overall product value stream conversation. 
And I think that uh, the, the skills are, are readily transferable. I think that it's going to be a challenge for some architects to uh, maybe adopt a bit more of a market facing stance, but there is still internal uh, challenges that might be reframed as product management. But at the end of the day, it's still the whole question of, well, are we, are we doing this in an effective way in an efficient way? Are we managing risk appropriately? Are we you know, redundant in our offerings? Is there a opportunity to factor out uh, shared services or common capabilities, common platforms? Are we uh, overextending ourselves? Do we uh, have too broad of a say? Is the security perimeter getting unmanageable because we've allowed too much pro proliferation? I mean, right now there's a lot of focus on independence and autonomy, but this is a pendulum. I mean, there's no way that that you know you can allow infinite autonomy amongst the product teams. Uh, sooner or later, you will have the very well understood problem of too many, essentially too many suppliers. And so I think that there is, you know, absolutely a lot of commonality here. I think that for the average enterprise architect or business architect, um, there is a rich, rich mother load of thinking to be found in product management. And if you have not explored product management, you need today to go out and acquire some of the material by, say, Melissa Perry, Steve Blank, Marty Kagan, Jeff Gothelf, Eric Reese. And these names aren't, you know, they're not the usual suspects in the EA space. And yet for my money, you know, the intellectual leadership has really passed over there uh, in many cases. And so it's super important for the practicing architect to be very well versed in the product management discourse today. Any other thoughts on this? Justin, you're looking thoughtful. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pass on this one for now. I, okay. I he hit everything I was was thinking. Great. Great. Okay, good. So we we have a new question here. We talk about agile quite a bit and agility and having that learning organization. So innovation and being able to test and deliver hypotheses about new potential digital products. And, and you know how you need to shape those to address market problems is a key capability. Um, how would you relate this um, you know, innovation and and uh, testing and learning uh, to the digital product management profession? Yeah, just from a product management point of view, I, I think what happens today is you can you know be in a large organization and get an idea for a product. You have to convince you know, leadership to invest or try that product out. And we're seeing more of a shark tank approach to that, even internally to say, okay, let's give you a little team. Let's go try this idea out and see what happens. But they also have to kill the product if it doesn't work out for whatever reason. If you find that the market is too uh, entrenched with other players that you're not, you know, familiar with, or uh, you, you find that there's some limitation in what you're starting with, right? From a platform perspective, uh, from a skill set perspective, um, most people can start a product company in their garage, and that's really where a lot of these big companies have come from. Uh, I've worked for one Dell down the road here in Austin. Uh, literally started in, in in Michael Dell's garage, but but the point is, you know, you could start with an idea and develop it on your own or outside your company or leverage resources internally. Uh, but I think that that scale, as you start to grow, you have to figure out what, you know, you've got, you got new players, you've got to answer for to customers, but, but investors, but, but we're willing to kill those products if they don't work out and, and be, you know, apply those agile principles of, of uh, trying things iteratively. <laughs> if it doesn't work, change course. If it does work, you know, continue down that course. But that's, that's really the print, I would say the key to, to, to digital products that we didn't have that in, in physical products alone. Yeah, no, I, and I, I would just, yeah, just uh, okay, I'll, I'll just quickly add uh, something to that is the digital product lines give you an opportunity to kind of foster that little bit of competition. Uh, so that you can see who your digital wildcats are. They're going to step up and really make the best case. So the, the product line manager can foster and drive a lot of that competitive thinking internal to the product line, trickle that up, 
and start, you know, really being a little bit competitive to see who can make the, the biggest, most impactful value case and pull that next round of capital investment and then execute successfully on that. So it's having that multiple layers of, you know, creating, you know, driving innovative thinking, but also having some control around it at different levels to say, yeah, this wasn't quite hitting what we wanted it to. Rob? Yeah, just a, yeah, I had a similar. So innovation can be on different levels, even within one product team. But if it's a new product, of course, there is not yet a product team. And then you come to the product line, indeed, as just was saying. And in some cases, maybe it's outside of the product line uh, goal because each line has a kind of purpose in life. And so that maybe you need. In, and then I think it's a good question: Where do you do in, in new things, startup models? Uh, so that you can accelerate, like quickly assemble a team, they create a prototype, put it in the market. But at the same time, you want to make sure, and, and that doesn't sound maybe very agile, but you want to see how does it fit in my overall product portfolio? And, and because my other pro my customer needs to recognize this as well, does it fit in your portfolio and does it fit in my customer journeys or not? But yeah, those kind of trade-offs you make. And I see that a lot of organizations that that it's not about how fast you can deliver, but how fast you can decide. Because typically you have a nice DevOps team that can deliver fast, but maybe it takes you three months to get funding and even have agreement of to start on this. So I think I think it's good to investigate that as well. How do you make that kind of early like lean startup model in your own organization in some areas um, to, to make sure that you can do that quickly if needed? Um, I want to pick up on a theme that I've seen in, in pretty much everybody's presentation about the interaction between teams and the need to recognize that uh, you know, the autonomous and agile teams are kind of the building block of productivity in these organizations. And this is a way we see a lot of organizations struggling to get this right. Um, you know, how do we standard, standardize the ways of working and the tools that support those ways of working? Uh, so that there is the ability to develop the organizational capabilities, or do we just let every team, you know, decide for themselves? How do we balance that? And Charlie, you mentioned this idea of the, the skilled resource, the, the, how to manage a skilled resource that has many touch points. How does that fit into this? It's an enormous problem, Dave, and I would absolutely say that, um, I mean, one of my favorite quotes from the, the Spotify um, retrospectives that are out there, is is that the, the you know there's a former Spotify employee I can't remember his name who's, who's got a fairly well 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 read critique of Spotify out there, and he said one of the problems was that every team at Spotify invented its own coordination protocols, you know whenever there was a need for two teams to interact they reinvented and reinvented because hey agile, you know, um, that's dumb. Uh, and it's ineffective and it's inefficient and you're going to lead to drop balls. It's going to lead to all kinds of things. It's why we have a whole section in the digital digital practitioner body of knowledge on work management and a, a section on coordination. Um, you've got to look at the coordination channels and you've got to look systematically at them. As I talked about in my, uh, my presentation, we know that when coordination implies a cue, a wait state, that this is when pain arises. We need to be honest and direct about this. And this is when you know the agile folks in the room will start pounding the table and say, we can't afford the cost of delay. And in many cases, they may be right. But then we need to say, well, that doesn't mean that it's simply carte blanche and everybody just goes back to you know uh, reinventing the wheels. We need to look more systematically at this as an organizational problem. And there's a wide variety of options that I think we need to uh, empower service owners with. And I talked about those in my presentation. I won't recap that here. Um, but I definitely think that coordination remains uh, one of the outstanding issues in the modern digitally transforming organization. Yeah, I would like, yeah, Charles, you're absolutely right. And, but I see organizations that have done a DevOps journey for, let's say, four or five years. They start with the model, the teams figure it out themselves and they implement their own ways of working. And after four or five years, they suddenly realize that to gain the speed for the whole enterprise, they need to scale also the standard ways of working. It doesn't sound very maybe agile, but 
the standard ways of working it can be considered like platforms because it enables teams to, to deliver faster but it depends on the maturity for of the enabling teams right so for example if i want to deploy something quickly then maybe if there are standard patterns i as a team don't need to figure it out how do i get security access firewall to changes getting access to infrastructure it's all standardized but i need to comply with some compliance issues potentially but think about azure as themselves if you want to develop a new product on azure at least they need to make sure it can be put in the catalog it can be charged for it can be built so there's a lot of standard reusable components where you as a team should use but if you use it you can also accelerate your delivery into into the market faster so it basically having a standard platform enabling which i see as a standard ways of working as well right they deliver kind of standard ways of working and that enables the team to deliver faster and better yeah, I'm assuming there are the right uh, platforms. That's what people don't believe, right? The team start. It's about trust as well. How good is the? Because they don't have good um, experience with in the past when you had to create an API. You go to an API platform team, let's say typical team. You have to wait three months to get your API implemented. That's not how people want to work, right? So that's probably where it's, if it self serves as self help, it will work. Okay. Well, I'm afraid that uh, we've kind of run out of time for our Q&A. Oh. I would invite all our panelists, so thank you. Uh, 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 I invite our panelists, we can leave these uh, questions up and if you wanna answer them in the Q&A, please do so. I wanna thank my panelists, you know, Justin, uh, Charlie, uh, Rob and Mark for this. 